don't know who started it. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the next big thing, a follow-up one year later. My name is Erika Smith. I'm the Executive Director of Bermuda Economic Development Corporation, and I am pleased to be with you today and for us to hold this follow-up webinar. Our purpose today is to discuss the fact that during this global pandemic, it is more important now to understand how to recognize business opportunities and if necessary, evolve and pivot to survive. Um, today, we're gonna hear about how entrepreneurs, real world entrepreneurs are solving real world problems. We're gonna tap into how to identify and take advantage of the opportunities for Bermuda's local entrepreneurs, even in this pandemic. And we hope that you leave today inspired to take the next step in your business endeavors. I wanna first and foremost introduce our moderator and our panel. Um, in November, 2019, we held an in-person seminar, a fireside chat called The Next Big Thing, Identifying Opportunities. And I thought it would be great and helpful to bring the entire panel back, you know, one year later, um, post or right when we're in this pandemic to see um, how we as entrepreneurs could actually move ourselves forward. So our panel today will consist of our moderator, Mr. Neville Grant, who is BDC's board deputy chair and also the head of corporate banking at HSBC. I'm also pleased to have the Premier of Bermuda, the Honorable E. David Burke, JPMP, here with us again. Um, and as you know, Bermuda knows that the Premier is an entrepreneur himself. So he understands um, what it takes to run and open a business um, and also the challenges and the opportunities that come with entrepreneurship. We also have Mr. Nori Bashir, who is the co-founder and co-owner of Burnt House Productions. Um, and is a fantastic creative entrepreneur in the Bermuda landscape and also globally. Mr. Talani Bolford is also joining us again, and he is a senior partner for Portland, Portland Lane Capital. Um, Talani and his partners own a number of businesses. He is a serial entrepreneur who invests in businesses um, and is really bullish with regard to tech businesses. Um, I don't think I have to introduce, but I will, Mr. Mariko Thomas, a serial entrepreneur in Bermuda. He is the owner of Four Star Glaze Burger Shack um, and the co-owner of Bermuda Medical Services Group and has owned many businesses throughout his lifespan. And then last but not least, um, we have Ms. Karen Franks, you know, as a female entrepreneur, she is the president and founder of the ADA Group Holdings Limited and also Dream Tales Incorporated. She is a established uh, entrepreneur and an author, uh, and she has authored Abbeydale's Dream Adventures and currently is in the process of trans transitioning that book series into a global animated uh, series. So the agenda for today, is obviously me giving the welcome introduction. And I'm so glad to see so many of you here today. We had close to 100 people register, so that speaks to the interest in the subject. Um, shortly, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Neville Grant, who will moderate. He'll give a very brief uh, overview of kind of the current business landscape and context, and then launch right into the moderated questions to panelists. Um, just some housekeeping. There is a question box um, in GoToWebinar. So if you have any questions that you want to ask, please type them in that question box. And then I will um, let the panelists know, the panel know um, that we have questions and read those questions. Um, there is also a handout, um, a brochure for the event today. So please download that. You should see a uh, panel box in the control panel that says handouts, download that handout. Um, have it on your laptop computer so that you can also have some information on these um, great entrepreneurs um, as well as the um, take notes for today. And then I'll close just before 1 p.m. to give you, um, to end the webinar and to say thank you for participating. So without further ado, I'll close this presentation. 
and I will turn it over to Neville to lead the discussion. Wonderful. Thank you, Erika, and uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, we have a great panel, uh, so we're going to dive right into it. I, I, I won't be too detailed, but I, I will say, imagine the shift that we have made from 14 months ago. We were sitting on a stage. We were talking amongst each other. You previously would have been sat in front of us, and, and you would not have showed up with a mask. You, you probably would not have washed your hands as frequently as you have now. Uh, and you, you certainly would not uh, have had to face the number of challenges that you would have seen. Now, it really depends on the industry that you, you're in as well, because I think COVID definitely had an impact to everybody, uh, but in different formats to different businesses and different industries. Again, we, we've seen you know huge forced adaptation, which I think has been great for Bermuda. We, we've seen great collaboration, which I think, again, is good for Bermuda. We've probably spent more time with family and at home than we've ever did before. We've probably had to adjust uh, our ways of working. And, and I would certainly say the customer experience and the customer journey has significantly changed. So with that, it, it would make sense that, you know, we, we're talking to you from home, uh, but, but COVID is, is definitely been the headliner over the past uh, 12 months. And so we want to talk a little bit about that. So panel, let, let's dive right into it because it, there's a number of interesting points. Let, let's first tackle the, the, the piece about adapt, adapt, adaptability, right? The, the need to adapt, to make change. So uh, Mariko, you, you were lucky enough to start this sort of anticipatory uh, journey on adaptation. Talk us a little bit about what that looked like in terms of delivery space versus dining and giving you in the restaurant and hospitality industry? Um, definitely we were on one path before the uh, COVID-19 experience, but once COVID-19 hit, uh, some of the things that we experienced were um, uh, suppliers who then said, uh, we are gonna go from 60 days to, to 30 days or from 30 days down to 15 days. So all of a sudden your cash flow became massively tight. You had um, uh, issues over the United States with uh, supply chain. So imagine not being able to get the normal cheese that we have and how customers will feel about the different cheese experience and how that feels inside their mouth, or in some cases not being able to get cheese at all, or tomato sauce um, um, ingredients. Um, there was uh, definitely a change in relationship with your banker who may then uh, have been a lot more um, uh, um, uh, concerned about uh, your financial status and whether or not you could pay the bills back. Um, one of the things that we did also is uh, down in Flats, we had spent quite a bit of money on renovating a restaurant um, and uh, the dining room restaurant. And we just had it finished in February and we were about to launch and COVID-19 hit. Um, so we spent a huge amount of money, but it's not unusual that the restaurant industry would spend money in the offs, what we would consider to be the slower season, and in preparation for hopefully the bounty that might be available to make up for that slow season come, come just sort of March through, let's say, uh, September, October, November. That didn't happen. So it really it created a, uh, a financial burden. It created a, uh, a burden on, uh, our, on our managers and also on the staff. Um, uh, we took the approach that we didn't want to uh, be a burden on the public purse. We, we, we did not. Actually, I need to stop for a second. Um, Mr. Premier, I have to say that, um, um, you know, the, the past uh, time that we have spent, um, uh, um, the support that you've been given to individuals with the, with, the, with the money that we received as individuals across the island, the support that you've been given to companies, um, whether it be through the BEDC or, or directly in terms of uh, some sort of taxation relief, uh, the guidance, the rules, the policies, the directives, uh, which have kept us safe, have all been uh, uh, massively appreciated. And if you haven't heard it uh, from others or me, I, I definitely want to make sure you hear that, because that has provided us with a platform for the opportunity to have a conversation like this. It, is, it may not be your responsibility to fix all of our problems, but you've given us a platform from which we can springboard and we can actually to start to address them um, as, a, as a group, not just you by yourself. So thank you very much for that and the team that supports you. Um, Great point we, have, 
we've, we've made some adjustments. So we, we've tried to figure out how do we reinvent ourselves? What do we, we can sit back and we can complain, but the complaint is not going to change anything. We can sit back and we can observe. The observation isn't going to change anything. We must get into trying new things and figure out what works and what doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, try something else. But you must try, you must move forward. Um, we have, uh, we um, had the, the, maybe the blessing, I suppose, of being in the delivery service. Uh, now, while what that meant for us was not that all of a sudden things were much better for us, what it actually meant for us is at least that our sales were not dropped as far as maybe some of the other restaurants might have fallen, but they still fell. So how do we keep our employees empl uh, hired? How do we keep them to have health insurance? How do we how do we do that for them and ourselves and, and be meaningful and stay forward? So we had to try to find ways to reinvent ourselves. So one of the things we did was we started delivering our entire menu. We were just about to do that in February. Anyway, we did it and that helped. Uh, we decided to work on that burger shop brand and, and that made a, a difference. It didn't, it didn't fly off on day one, but I'll tell you uh, a, a big part of this also was, is, is, is being prepared. You actually have to look forward a bit more uh, outside of just you know one week, two weeks, one month, two months, you've got to look further down that road so that you can have the opportunity to be prepared. So that when things like this come your way, you can choose which arrow in your quiver do you want to pull back and shoot. Yep, that makes sense. And I think Mariko, you, you've made a great transition because I do want to bring the premier on in that particular point uh, because. The, not only the government, I think Mariko hit the nail right on the head. You, you've done an excellent job of managing what is a real a health crisis, uh, and not only just from a health crisis perspective, but transitioning in terms of the economic impact that that health crisis has had. So, so Premier, it's, like, it's a two-part question. One is about uh, the quick adapt, uh, adaptability that, that the government had to adopt. Uh, and then the second piece is, I've, I've always been intrigued in some of your COVID uh, updates that you will be talking about the businesses that have transitioned and supported. I could think of one, I've got your cover. She was doing, you know, tent covers and then all of a sudden uh, boat covers and then she was making PPE masks. And and so you would talk about some of these during your press conferences, which, which was great advertising. But if you're able to talk to us a bit about that adaptability from a government perspective, as well as where you have seen entrepreneurs come to you or, or the rest of your government colleagues that have pivoted. Let me make sure I don't get one of those people a meme which says you're on mute, Premier. And that seems like <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I need to make sure I take it off a of mute before I start speaking. Uh, good morning uh, to you, Neville, and good morning uh, to uh, fellow panelists. I just want to make a quick correction to something that the wonderful executive director says in the introduction. She said that um, that I am an entrepreneur. I would like to correct the record that I used to be an entrepreneur, and I'm looking forward to the days when I could be an entrepreneur again. <laughs> Um, I am I am running uh, a government, uh, which is a completely uh, different experience, but it ties into, I guess, the thing in which you've spoken about and the questions of which you had asked when it comes to quick adaptability. And the fact is that entrepreneurs have to be able to adapt very quickly. When you're a business owner, you can't go to anyone else. You have you are the boss, and you're the one who is responsible for making sure uh, that uh, everything uh, runs the way it needs to be. So you have to uh, adjust very quickly. Uh, in this instance, we've had to think in very nimble forms and put together things uh, very quickly. And I don't want to lean too much on IT uh, speak, but you know, there's different forms of software development, and the government just had to be very agile and to get things running. So when we're talking about the unemployment program and assistance, of which uh, was Marika was discussing, you know, we stood that up in the space of a week. Uh, when we're talking about the support that the BDC came up with on how they can deliver it to persons, that was had to be spun up very quickly. Policy things like that typically take months and months and months of analysis and everything like that. We just didn't have the chance. Uh, we didn't have the opportunity. There was some prior planning. There was some notification of things that may happen. We got the government ready for, you know, making sure we can deliver services remotely should the need occur and, and investigate things. But as we remember last year, March, things moved very, very quickly. But in the exact same way that we transitioned, I would say, from a government perspective, we've seen that transition happen in the business community. We have this conversation discussion on economic terms about why was the assistance important? And in my view, the assistance was important so that businesses could focus on survival and figuring out how to adapt. 
if there was not that support that was there from the BDC or was there was not that support that was going to individual employees or individual persons, then we would have a far different situation. I remember, you know, someone says, is the assistance going to provide it so that people actually have jobs to go back to? Now, yes, we have lost uh, some businesses. There's no question about it. But the fact is, we've also seen businesses sprout up. We've seen some businesses grow. And those are the ones that can adapt to what is necessary to function in a world. The one other thing which I can say is that, you know, everything is a blessing and a curse. And it's very difficult to say in any way, shape or form that the coronavirus pandemic is a blessing, especially with the loss of life and the economic dislocation, which it's caused. But it has forced the government, other agencies and certainly persons in a place like Bermuda who would not have adapted to certain things in so far as technology and otherwise to make sure they went ahead and done that quicker. And what I view the responsibility when we talk about the next big thing is, as we know that we're going to go forward with this in the exact same way that the government made sure that we provide assistance so that individuals can focus on their businesses and building it out versus trying to figure out how to survive. We are now going to think about, you know, providing just the base rails on for online businesses and others so that people can focus on the innovation rather than focusing on, you know, the, the, the nitty gritty and all the rest. And that's the type of transformation I think, which is necessary. Um, and I think as long as we can help entrepreneurs get there, I think that's helpful. No, that is a great point because I was gonna highlight this this concept premier that you raised is how, how do we not forget that sense of urgency to adapt and move? Because I, I think uh, BDC have been talking for a number of years about embracing online technology, creating, uh, these virtual uh, portals, uh, you know, getting a, a larger virtual presence and to see the likes of delivery websites uh, and, the, and the advent of use of technology in a place like Bermuda, which has been slow to adapt, uh, has been forced to adapt, which is a great thing. And that's where I think in, in talking to Talani and Karen, maybe this is a good time to talk a little bit about how not every industry was impacted in the same way. Talani, I know you uh, outlined how uh, you had seen a demand in the sort of software space and a demand for work, which gave you a different challenge than you would have historically had, because now you were really managing capacity. Yes, agreed, Nabu. Thank you, to Act of what Marika said as well. Bermuda's done very well through the pandemic, and credit goes to the Premier and his team for managing that, which created a platform for us to actually thrive. What we've noticed in the software industry being a part of it is that capacity has increased in some instances almost 800 percent so if you any any of the platforms that you're using now if you're in that space creating VoIP communications virtually your job your job list right now you're, if you're employed in SRT, you can pick and choose where you're going to be so what we've noticed that shift is actually now starting for countries like bermuda where bermuda has always been in a position to say technology is the future now technology is not all for Bermuda, which is great from our perspective because that allows a new ranges of businesses and types of entrepreneurs to be a part of that. So we've definitely seen an uptick around the world and specifically in Bermuda in terms of what digital environments can do to enhance because as the world went through the global lockdown, one industry didn't, communications. Communications became the bread and butter of what countries needed to survive. And so to do that, they needed to scale and scale quickly like what the Premier said, his team had to spin up solutions relatively quickly, which in some instances would have took months and years. And I think most countries are now facilitating that as well. And you're seeing countries now saying, how can we facilitate that through education? Because the bedrock of any type of communications or technology company is highly driven, highly motivated, and highly educational proficient workers, right? And so Bermuda's going on that same path now saying, you know, education has to be at the forefront of it as well, because to continue this growth in this sector for Bermuda to be a part of it, Education has to be front and center, especially when it comes to STEM and anything to do with science and mathematics, right? So we're definitely bullish on where the future holds. But if you're planning on getting into this industry right now, I think this is probably the best time since probably the 80s to get into the technology industry where right now companies are really, is a global arms race for talent. So very yeah, few companies right now are saying, you know what, we're looking for people that's coming out of with advanced degrees. If you have the drive and a base level of knowledge, we'll take you. And we'll teach you everything else. Let's go. As long as you have that drive and that desire to really get into it, that's good. So we see opportunities going leaps and bounds, especially now of artificial intelligence now being brought into the foray in terms of because of COVID-19, the Tyler Madison sector is heating up. And these are the concepts that have been around for almost 20 years now. But because of COVID-19, money's being thrown in it from an investment perspective. 
now we're looking for staff. Every company is saying the same thing in the technology industry. Where can we find staff? Opportunity. Yeah, that, that's a, it's a great point, Delani, because again, the Premier highlighted this double-sided coin impact, right, where there's positives and negatives. And, and so, yeah, it, it, it's about embracing it both. And Karen, you, you talk a bit about how, you know, because you're, you're a staff of one and the brain power of one, uh, you didn't see a lot of impact necessarily on the staff perspective and, and not so much in terms of your branding. So you, you've seen some unique changes in your industry as well. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, the family entertainment industry um, is actually are in higher demand and, you know, everything is streaming right now. Um, so it's been it's been good for me. I've got, uh, you know, a lot more opportunities than, say, you know, last year deals were done differently last year. So like now we're looking at a whole ecosystem of streaming. You've got TV on demand, you've got streaming on demand, and then you have like a AVOD which is like an aggregate of it all. Um, so, you know, right now, you know, it's a pretty exciting time for me. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to see, to see what's in, in the future. Um, and, and, it, and it's looking really, really well. Um, it, during this time through COVID, being stuck home, I generally travel like every three months for business. And so it's allowed me, like Eureka reminded us, it's been like 14 months since we've seen each other. And so uh, in, within that time, I pulled out an, a manuscript from 2017 and finally finished um, the book series. Well, the book series, I wouldn't say finished, but the book series, and I have book three, so please go out and I'm going to plug it. Us that have had new babies and all sure, this Yeah, time. exactly, exactly. Yeah. Not, not, not. I see you looking around, Premier. Not, not anybody on this panel. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've already showed them to him. Actually, I think he tried to go, to get away with them. Um, but that's another story. Um, yeah. So you know, I just I published the third book in in the series, and it was so timely because at the time in 2017 when I started, um, we, and then now we've got a whole lot of other movements going on. You know, uh, Black Lives Matter. Um, you know, women, we have a new woman in the White House, which is exciting for me. Um, yes. Inspired me yesterday to tears, so I'm excited about that. So, you know, publishing the third book, it's about Abigail jumping inside a puddle and the puddle spits her out in Africa. So it was timely. It's all about, it's still about diversity and, and dream building for children. So uh, there are a lot of uh, great opportunities for me happening right now. And, and um I've uh, created, incorporated another company in Atlanta, and uh, I have an entertainment lawyer now. So she's bringing all these opportunities to me, and it's, uh, it's an exciting time for me. I've actually been, uh, a lot of my stuff has been looked at and uh, sort of, you know, it, it, I know it's good, but when someone in the industry wants to pitch it immediately and, uh, you know, wants to get involved with it, that has a position in that industry as well established that is definitely a compliment to me. So I'm excited about this time. Unfortunately, it's it's not the best of times. We've had to think outside the box. And, you Ooh. know, uh, my thoughts are with uh, everyone who has lost uh, someone to COVID during this time, but it's allowed us to definitely think outside the box. And I'm always a person that thinks outside the box. But as an entrepreneur, you know, we have um, our ups and downs, and, and it's allowed me, I just did an article for the Toronto Caribbean newspaper, and it's allowed me as a woman to be more at peace when uh, things are uncomfortable, to be comfortable when I'm uncomfortable, and uh, know that, you know, you're going to get past this, we're going to think differently, uh, we have to act differently, uh, follow the rules, and, uh, you know, our, our premier has our back, uh, we've had this discussion, I'm very proud of him and I do remember as we discussed he told me that one day he would be premier so um oh, wow. careful, careful what you ask for yes speak it into existence Karen that, that's for sure because uh, you know, thank you for that and congratulations on your article because I think that's a great representation and we're going to talk a little bit later on about this shift from local to global so hang on to that thought but Nori I just wanted to bring you into the discussion because Karen talked about the increased need for content, and she's absolutely right. We're probably spending more time sitting in front of our TVs, iPads, laptops, et cetera, uh, because we don't have the flexibility uh, and from the safety precautions of going out in, in, in public domain. So 
whilst Karen, did, Karen is providing content, you're actually creating and building content, which, which makes it a little bit trickier because that does involve the hand-to-hand -hand combat of sorts. So walk us through the challenges associated with that in your business. Okay, I mean, uh, thank you guys very much. It, it's great to be on a panel with you all again. Um, I want to start off by echoing everyone else's sentiments. Um, Premier and the government and, and the agencies aligned with the Premier have done an amazing job in providing assistance to people and, uh, and specifically entrepreneurs. And, and I think that you guys have done an, an impeccable job. Um, I know we've all patted you on the back, but I think it, it's well worth and due. So, uh, I wanted to make sure that I, I started with that and we've had a number of conversations and I continue to and I'll continue to toot that one. So you did a, you did a great job. Um, in terms of and I think I'll take a, a step back from your question and talk about like the the year prior, right? So obviously everyone plans on what they're going to be doing into 2020, into 21. And uh, and my business partner and I, we had sat down and all of our plans were around global domination right shooting content in different countries in the world and providing uh services around the world and it was it was an amazing start to the uh to our plan we had shot some work in saint lucia we had put in a bid uh to shoot for an amazing property down in mexico that we had won so to speak the, the check didn't get cut because covid cut that right out of our pocket um but <laughs> the the year and planning was all to do with leaving the island and doing things abroad, like our global expansion. Um, and then COVID-19 hit. I was actually flying back from Panama when uh, they were telling everyone to, you know, bunker down and, and stop contacting people and all that kind of stuff. And I got in, I think, maybe like a couple of days before we were locked down. Um, and so when we were put into the first set of phases, like for us, it was like completely detrimental. I looked into this abyss, which was my business, <laughs> and said, what, what do we do now? Because I can't physically go out and take pictures of anyone. I can't physically go out and, and, uh, and, and conduct video productions. Um, we can't physically do anything. Um, and so it was really, really a challenge in time mentally to try to figure out how we would pivot and change and uh, and provide some form of um, financial income for ourselves when we couldn't physically go out anymore. Now I have to caveat that because if my wife is watching, um, we had a daughter right in and around this time. So if you looked at my travel schedule, I was actually supposed to be traveling up until like two days before um, her due date, but she came two weeks early. So I was able to like be here. Uh, thank you, Premier. For my uh, for my daughter's birth, um, so you saved my marriage on that one, and COVID nineteen saved my marriage <laughs> for that one also. Um, but it also provided, um, even though on the business front there was this uh, complete halt, uh, it provided the ability for me to really focus on my family and the things that were truly the things that mattered. And I think that that's kind of one of the unspoken things. A lot of people talk about the downside to COVID-19 and loss of life is always um, a hard thing to, for any community to have to deal with. Um, and I think we're still reeling off of that. But um, I think for me specifically, and I think it's echoed in some of the sentiments of some of my colleagues and friends, the, the time with family, um, if you are a family person, was, was great. So thank you for saving my marriage on that one, Premier. And uh, it, it was, it was, yeah. it was well 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 received thank you um, yeah because when, so, when you said that you you thank the premier for the birth of your daughter i, I see the expression on his face it was, it was a big concern so oh, well at that <laughs> but, but, i i, I if, if you're gonna start paying i'll take it you know <laughs> <laughs> but nori just while you had the mic in so, you talked a little about this global transition i know talani uh referenced this uh once before as well is you know, if we want to grow, we got a population of 60 to 66,000 people on island, uh, but there's a whole wider world. And, and, and given the fact that we have, are connected through Zoom and go to meeting and meet X and various different platforms and the portals are increasing. Talk, talk to us a little bit about your thoughts and your views. And, and I'll welcome some of the other panel's views as well on the expansion, not just here in Bermuda, uh, but globally in terms of accomplishing the next big thing. 
Okay, so I mean, what I'll do is I'll just finish the the the, the thought process, right? Because I was giving the, the premier a lot of credit, and I gave him a lot of my time. Um, and I'll jump right into that. Uh, I'll jump right into that answer. But basically, Andrew and I, uh, we had to change, right? We changed our business model altogether, um, and we focused more on him and how we could deliver content and how we could deliver services to people here. And basically, uh, the model that we that we are operating now, if we look at the way that we're generating revenue now versus where we were prior to the pandemic, we are in a stronger position now than we were going into it. Um, and I think that that has created the bedrock for like expansion on a larger scale for when travel and all those things do um, kick back in. So I just want to finish with that part. So there was the turmoil, there was the abyss, there was the childbirth and the family time, but the, the reflection and the re-evaluating, I think you called it force adaptation was the terminology you used. The force adaptation has put us in a stronger position. I think that we're better off for it um, now than before. And so jumping on to what Talani had mentioned, which is the communication, right? So at, there's back end, and then there's front end, and there's probably a number of different facets as it relates to communication. Um, the back end being the technology side, the people that are doing the coding, that are writing the code to make sure that these things can be delivered seamlessly to customers. On the front end of that is the actual things or, or the actual images that go out made, or the content that goes out. So what I found is that in this new world of content creation or of digital um, platforms, content creators have become like extremely vital were a number of businesses that had no digital platform, had no digital representation, had, you know, they, they didn't do anything online because they had kind of, um, they had relied on traditional methods. Now they have really found themselves in a position where content creation has taken over and, and they need it. It's, it's, yeah, I don't think it's going to go back. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers your specific question, but from my end, which is the, I guess, the front end of it, the pretty side of uh, of communications, it's it's huge, and I think that um, I don't think we're going back in in that realm. No, it's 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 a great point, and and uh, Talani, I see you, uh, and 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 uh, it, this was primarily your thought and your concept, so I'll, I'll let you wax eloquent, and then I'll invite the premier to talk a little bit about. You know some of the experience he's seen from a governmental perspective of sharing across borders but talani i'll let you go first to finish your thought on the global economy well the one beautiful thing we've taken what nori said starting his journey to expand globally being in the global in the global entrepreneurial landscape now for 15 years it actually done the reverse for me when could first hit this is my first time being in bermuda for four years i started to sit down and be stationary and it was kind of nerve wracking for the first few weeks. But the thing I learned was everybody around the world was in the same position. So business contacts and clients and people that I were trying to connect with, usually we would take three weeks to connect, we was able to talk. And because of that, we started spreading up more and more different business solutions, business concepts, and different projects that we have been sitting on for years. So I think that's one of the things that COVID-19 actually done because of the changing of the way business is done, it's now making everyone push forward. And I think that's great. So I think we're now moving into an environment where for Bermuda, if you're a local entrepreneur, it's really time for you to start thinking global. Bermuda needs local entrepreneurs like what Nora's doing, what others are doing, what Karen's doing to literally leave Bermuda, go and create businesses, bring revenue back to Bermuda, build up back offices in Bermuda, just like what the reinsurance boys have done here since the 80s and 90s. But we need that being done by locals here because we're tied to this country some way, some form, and that will really help spur our economy to keep increasingly growing and stop having to be over-reliant on outside influences to come and start businesses to do the same thing. And I think now from the conversations have a lot of entrepreneurs in Bermuda in the last six months because I've been there, I see people now looking outward because they've been stuck at home and the world's now opened up to them. So that to me is a beautiful thing. Excellent, excellent, Delaney. I think it's a great point. And, and this is where I'll, I'll, I'll bring the premier in on this because I think there were a couple of examples from a governmental perspective where you shared testing kits with some of the island colleagues. Uh, I, I've talked about some time about, you know, rather than buying a building as an entrepreneur, could you condominiumize that building and, and, and share floors? Uh, you know, people bringing in one large order uh, and then sharing that amongst the, the users. So if you if you could talk on that theme, both from a governmental perspective and, and, and probably a wider vision 
of this, this cooperative economics, not in the true sense of the word, but certainly the base of it. Well, certainly. I mean, when we're talking about uh, the next big thing, I think it's important that we focus um, as well on a point that's related to some other things that are made. And the fact is that one of the things that I say often when people talk about businesses going in business and out of business, I remind people and the young people now probably might even not remember. But Trimminghams went out of business during an economic boom. <laughs> so businesses go out of business in boom times and businesses go out of business in bus times. And that's just the fact. <laughs> But the businesses that have been able to survive and have been able to adapt during this pandemic will be positioned for really good growth when we come out of it. And that is something that is beneficial for the country. And the reason why it's beneficial to the country is that economic growth, just from an economics perspective, comes from population growth and comes from productivity growth. So if you are able to have productivity growth, you are certainly going to have more economic growth. And I think that's something that bodes well uh, for uh, the country as a whole. Insofar as cooperating, I think that the pandemic certainly has boosted that cooperation, both on a local level with persons working together, being forced to, as Solani had said, collaborating more because now you just have more time to collaborate. And especially when you know you were uh, in-house for shelter in place at the very beginning and the admonitions uh, that would camp come from the press conferences were, you know, you can spend the time and uh, be like I was at Christmas and come out of Christmas 20 pounds heavier and just eat or you could, um, or you can uh, go, yeah, it was really weird. I, I had the first press conference after I came back and someone sent me a WhatsApp says, you had a really good holiday. I'm like, what do you mean? It's like, you can see it in your face. I was like, that's not there. <laughs> But, but, but in saying that, it allowed people, as uh, Talani had said, the the, um, the ability to collaborate, to think of new things, to figure out how we're going to get to the next step and, you know, the plans and rejigging. But the collaboration aspect is important. And so we did collaborate internationally. Um, it is certainly something. Uh, we were fortunate uh, that Dr. Weldon came back and so we were able to, you know, implement certain things using homegrown talent. And I think it's kind of that uh, it's a corollary to what Talani had said, that we were able to figure out how to do things here and we were able to share that with other countries and they were appreciative and they would also share back certain things which they had so there was lots of different things that took place and i mean it's even the stuff of which we're doing now when it comes to the vaccination effort a challenge that we certainly have is that we are fortunate to have access to vaccines whereas other countries literally do not have a single dose and we're sitting here arguing over how many how fast we get out the doses and how fast we can expand where there are certain places right. where there is a single one so collaboration is important, and I think that from the perspective of um, this uh, pandemic uh, itself and how it's forced businesses to uh, change and adapt, I certainly think that one of the things that will come out of this is the businesses that have been positioned to survive during these lean times are going to be positioned for really good growth in, uh, in the growth phase. No, it's, a, it's a great point, Premier, and uh, I, I kind of gave you a soft volley because there are another great example of that was the exporting of the concept of the, the bracelet. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think, you, you know, you talked about how that would be a great idea in Bermuda, it worked well. Uh, and then given the success that it had in a smaller, you know, more insulated community, it was able to that concept to be exported. So I, great things can happen in Bermuda uh, and, and th those ideas can be certainly exported and, and delivered across the world. So again, a great work in some of the things that you've done. Uh, Mariko, I just want to bring you in as well, because one of the items that we, we kind of discussed was around diversification uh, last last year. And, you know, you, you are the master of diversification from donuts to burgers to pizza to Indian food. Uh, so just from your sense, what, what have you seen in terms of the benefits of a more diversified portfolio, not just specifically in the food industry, but just diversification in general? Um, you can tie your, the one trick pony thing, you know, it, it's, you live and die by that one, whatever that thing is. And, uh, there are times when you will be in favor or, or, or life in the environment will favor that thing. And there are times when it won't. And, uh, there goes all your hopes and dreams, you know? So, uh, I, I, I would suggest, I have heard, you know, most times that I've heard it, it was always re relative to sort of um, um, anytime I've heard I'd be in a conversation or, or in a class about 
sort of investing and you shouldn't invest all your uh, you know, in, in a particular way you shouldn't just take all your money and put it under your pillow you know you should you should right. move it around and do different things with it um that is actually that I, I didn't actually think about the, um um it in terms of how you just said it even in terms of our menu what we've done with food but there is a, a distinct difference in um um in different parts of our menu and i actually can see just looking at our menu what's happening with the economy uh, there are certain parts of our menu that do very very well when the economy is stronger and um or in a recession and when the economy is stronger or when there are number million, more number readings than island or less so we can actually look in, we can actually look inward and actually tell you what's going on outward it's very very interesting actually this, this, is, this is very interesting this is like the new economic indicators we're going to call it you know the Mariko <laughs> uh future indicators of the economy performance uh, don't worry marie yeah. i'm being the pizza in there but but it, i was more thinking as well because you have a medical practice under your yes. umbrella companies and and again something that would do relatively well you would expect during the COVID period uh, so again so, yeah i appreciate that and i i would have expected so too um so that's that's a that's a that's a different beast and quite challenging so What's been different? Um, the typical medical experience. Um, so to rewind for a second, and, and and sometimes I think we have to be careful of, of of getting what we ask for. That's the first thing I'm going to say, right? Um, so um, my my passion for medicine is related to a family member who is a physician who is passionate about medicine, and my goal was to be in support of that as opposed to. Uh, first and foremost, that I understood medicine and that I wanted to be in medicine. I wanted to be in support of somebody else who wanted to do good in medicine. And um, um, and and there were there were two uh, specific uh, points that we were trying to address, and that was to reduce the number of people going inside the hospital, reduce the number of people going off island for care. We thought that those were noble, useful, and would actually help cut costs and bring benefit. But it's been an extremely difficult uh, go. Um, COVID-19 uh, impacted medicine as well in that uh, many people either could not or were afraid to come out of their homes uh, uh, being ill. So one of the uh, changes that actually happened was telemedicine. Uh, tele things in healthcare, I mean, under normal circumstances, I would be talking to entrepreneur, entrepreneurs, other people in business that are on change, and people are not uh, comfortable with change. And, and they, they face that sort of, a lot of resistance. Um, these are people both wanting to get into business and people that are in business. Healthcare is a beast, uh, a total different beast. The, the change management that happens in healthcare is a lot more sticky than anything else that I've seen anywhere else. It's, it's, it's a bit unfortunate because there's a huge amount of uh, need uh, to do things differently, both from a financial perspective as well as a, uh, an outcome perspective. Um, the telemedicine wouldn't probably never have happened if COVID-19 had happened. I mean, the one cool thing about COVID-19, maybe it's not cool, I should, that's maybe unfair to some instances, that COVID-19 was an accelerator. It was a conduit for, right. for what was already going to happen. If, you, if your business was probably already heading south, it, happened, it went south faster. If your business mm. was probably already efficient, then you were able to take advantage of those efficiencies better. If you probably yes. had a, 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 if you're a service like something like like maybe the hospital and you you found you found that the excuses sometimes went away because the money wasn't there the need got high or there were constraints that caused you to have to adapt beyond whatever confines that you had in your brain about what you thought you could or couldn't do or what somebody else was telling you you couldn't couldn't do it created yes. and facilitated change. And that in itself is a good thing as long as we've learned about what real change is and then what's possible and how we can change. So, that, that, I, uh, perfect. That, that is exactly, and I think it's probably a point that I, I would want to throw out to the entire panel about this mindset shift, right? Because I talked a little bit about in the introduction, the change of the customer journey. So what you've just described about would I have would I have been interested in a call-in visit to my doctor? No, you know I'm used to getting up, going into his office, sitting in the waiting room, getting up, standing on the scale reluctantly, like the premier, uh, and then going through the, the various different motions. But what had to happen in the COVID environment? 
you get contacted. It, it was it was much quicker. It was much more efficient. They called exactly at the time. You didn't have to interrupt your schedule and the like. So what we're really talking about is a change in the customer journey and a change in the environment that kind of precipitated or forced that change. So out to the entire panel, given, given this sort of new change in philosophy, thought, uh, behavior, uh, you know, forced change due to COVID, what do you see us doing to adapt to the next big thing? What, what, are, what, are, what opportunities does that create, that sort of change in mindset? Um, I would say just um, embrace, just being more open and, and embracing. I had a, a conversation with a school teacher yesterday from the middle schools, and I'll be actually um, chatting with over 300 kids uh, in the next few weeks. But, you know, I believe it's a mindset. And when we talked about my book and it being pink and the boys are like, this is just a little example. The boys are like, eh, it's pink. I don't want to look at it. It's like, you know, as adults, I mean, because something is not appealing to us or it's supposed to be for a specific gender or for a specific culture, you know, we're not open to it. And uh, so I think COVID has, you know, made us do things differently. Um, mm. I think people need to embrace the change as difficult as it is because it's like a butterfly. It's like a cocoon and then you sort of, you know, you learn from it and then you expand and then you, you fly off and to all sorts of different dream worlds. And so um, I think it's just about embracing new things instead and being kind and communicating with one another instead of, you know, it's a terrifying time. I mean, when this first started and you were at the grocery store, you would look at someone and they would turn away because everyone's terrified. And so yes. I think, you know, the, the, the government has gotten us past that first stage and we're into another phase um and we're a little safer a little bit more confident some too confident you know so we have to sort of rein that in and and, and get everybody on the same but i think it's just about um people really taking the time to learn how to embrace this change and that self-care and and um you know That's just communicating differently to each other. It's, it's, it's a good lead in, Karen, because I think what you're what you're ultimately describing is this sort of anticipatory behavior of, okay, now that this has occurred, what would this mean? And and then the next step after that to create the next big thing, you're also thinking, how could I apply that to business? So again, I still th throw it out to the panel, your thoughts on, if, on this change can. of mind. Sure, because I, because I think it's important to them. The screen there. there. Um, I still am the rose between the thorn. Um, oh, absolutely. Jeez. Exactly. Um, you know, as I talk to my partners in the industry, like I said, the shift there is, is, is arts and family entertainment. And because, um, you know, it, it's in higher demand. And, and do you guys know why it's in higher demand? Do you know why family entertainment is in higher demand? Because we're probably spending more time with them. With family, family, family yeah. With, stuck kids, at home. Stuck with, kids, with kids at home, which stuck yes. at home with, with the kids. And so, you know, we're looking for more things for our children. And like Talani said, you know, education is where we start with that. Um, but, you know, it, it, streaming and, and uh, the entertainment industry is, is focusing more on the family entertainment. And because these children are stuck at home and, you know, they want something for them to do. And so, uh, you know, the focus um, financially um, is it, going to be incredible for that side of the business. But, you know, like my, my lawyer was saying, like she's seen that, that the industry shift a little bit more to, to focus on family and entertainment. You can go now. Uh, no, no, thank you. Thank you, Madam Rose. I will now turn it over to... Uh... Any of the thorns, uh, Premier? Okay. Fire away. I'll turn off my mic. <laughs> there, there, there was just one thing on uh, the issue of the mindset shift and kind of related to some of the things that Karen was saying. Uh, because at the same time, we talk about how we've had to do things differently. Um, I think that something that has also come out of this, which is going to be essential for the country's survival um, and for the country's growth, is the mindset shift of being it being necessary to collaborate in order to survive. 
people had to lean on other people's businesses. People had to say, okay, let's just try to work together. Let's try and do this and try and do that. Okay, you have this, I have this. Let's try and pool these together and pool resources. It's the type of thing in which you were speaking and alluded to earlier, uh, Neville, when you spoke about you know cooperative and cooperative economics and cooperating. But I think that that has been a mindset shift that has been beneficial for Bermuda. It's something that, of course, we've had, you know, not been very good at. You know, you'll see it in pockets versus it being a way of life. And it's one of the things mm -hmm. that's viable for business. And it's one of the things that we have to continue to engender. And it's something that we have to continue on. Or else, you know, when we get to a growth phase, if we then start going together and, uh, you know, in our little silos, it's going to be difficult. And I think that, as Talani um, had mentioned and as Nori had said, that that was his plan. Bermudian businesses need to focus on not competing for the pie locally, cooperating in local business so they can co come together and compete for the pie internationally and in other jurisdictions. And I think that's important. We find so much time fighting amongst each other, splitting up the little market share of which we have here versus cooperating and then saying, okay, we can deal with this here. This is what's done. We've done this in a cooperative fashion. Now let's start tackling things in other places because we've demonstrated, whereas other places might be having their little individual fights. We have the stuff that are here and we can go Agreed. ahead and expand. So I think that's an important lesson. And that's something, you know, the next big thing, because Bermuda has always been constrained by the size of its market. And so if we then look at how we can do things so we can expand to add more to the top line, I think that's something that um, Bermudan entrepreneurs should certainly be uh, focusing on. No, it, it, and, and what I will say on that point, because I, I think it, it, it bears repeating, I watched the Front Street restaurants decide during the pandemic to alternate days that they would be in operation. So one person would not be in competition with the other. And that speaks exactly to that concept and mindset. And, and even from a government perspective, I, I would say credit to you, Premier, because one night I saw yourself, the opposition leader and the governor all sitting on the same stage uh, smiling and congratulating each other. And, and so that is an example of COVID's impact being forcing us to, to, to collaborate where it didn't impact one gender, race, color, creed, opposition, or government. It impacted everybody. So it forced us to have a common enemy. And I think that unification, we can't forget what that looks like and how we could make that more applicable to business. So I think a great point, a great point. Very well said. Very well if said. I can, if I can jump in on this. Uh, sure, jump away. Yeah, no, I, I, I think I, I share the sentiments of everyone on the uh, panel so far. Um, one of the other things that you might, uh, and maybe the premier might know it as a, you know, side, but for the first time, you know, I had other people calling me with all of the COVID guidelines, and they were going through the guidelines through a fine, with a fine tooth comb, trying to figure out what they could do within the guidelines, you know, without, get, you know, breaking the law. And so where they say, like, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, um, you know, in this environment where you're told you have to, you have to fit within this box, you have to do it within these combines, you've seen, like, time and time again, entrepreneurs really trying to figure out, okay, but if this is the combine, if, you know, people can only go to shop on this specific day with this last name or whatnot, how can we get groceries to people outside of that? How can we get uh, products to people outside? You know, and you've seen this um, this shift in mindset where before I think a lot of businesses, because you know, the the Bermuda it, it exists in a number of different ways in my mind. You have a lot of old money and businesses that have had and been established because they have a name or they have friends or there's this this old school mindset. And then you kind of put everybody into the gravel pit and people have to work together to get out of it, you know? And so it's a it's an interesting dynamic. And for the creative side, and, and I forgot to even mention this, but, you know, where we talk about um, necessity for us to be able to collaborate. As an example, um, there was supposed to be a team that was coming out to shoot for Travel and Leisure, for, as an example. And they were trying their best to get this thing, the shoot pulled off. Um, and then, you know, travel being prohibitive, they contacted us and like, look, we can't have our team come down and shoot this thing. It's, it's not possible for us to do it, like as much as we would love to. Um, so what we'll do is, uh, can we hire you guys, you Bermudian guys, to shoot the vision for us, um, you know, and, and, and deliver something for an international agency 
that would have typically been done by international guys. And now we're basically on the roster to be able to shoot more content for those guys if and when travel opens back up. So it's forced us to have to try to figure out how to work with each other. It's forced other people to try to figure out how to work with us and within the confines that they've been put in. And I think that if this spirit, you know, even on a governmental level, on a local level, where we're trying to figure out, or the premier, I mean, specifically, you're trying to figure out how to keep a country going with, uh, you know, this global, <laughs> this global dynamic, right? And so it's it's necessity, and I think that the mindset of an entrepreneur should always be to try to figure out how to turn over rocks and how to, um, you know, find the gaps in any legislation or rule or whatever's been put around you to be able to create economic opportunities. I'd like to jump in off of that. I'm speaking sure. to a North and also what the Premier said about collaboration. One of the things that I'm very happy to see in Bermuda, people start to embrace divergent ways of thinking. And for me, that means people start to re-embrace it. What does our culture look like? Bermuda, to me, historically has been a culture of no, not a culture of why not, or let's do something different. And so if these divergent viewpoints now being presented because of COVID-19 is allowing people to say, you know what, how do we, we want to shape Bermuda to how it should be in terms of what the global economy looks like? And so I'm very bullish on that. But one of the things I've seen because of the more content that's been pushed out over the last nine months has been people not being hooked on Netflix. And when I speak to someone, I say, you've been hooked on Netflix, you're watching Netflix three, four hours a day. How much have you been online and done any e-learning courses? What have you done to increase your awareness and your upskilling? And that's where I think we need to be very careful that we don't get complacent because COVID-19 has created a new normal and we've transitioned past that now and people are starting to get comfortable in that new environment. We can't allow ourselves as a country and as a culture to start to say, this is exactly how it's always going to be because then we're back to square one. We always have to be always looking and changing and having divergent viewpoints to assess things differently because entrepreneurs are part of a, of a culture the part of an economy. So if the culture is stagnant, the economy is stagnant, the entrepreneurial community is gonna be stagnant. You know, it can happen in isolation, they go together. So more divergent ideas, more divergent ways of doing things, just opening up discussion would actually create a better entrepreneurial environment, which will facilitate better growth prospects and growth potential. No, I, it, it is something, and I think it's, it's a point that you've highlighted multiple times, Talani about the education and i think the premier was was making this point very early in the COVID presentations by saying go out train learn and, and one of the items that came up across the entire panel when we were having this sort of pre-discussion was COVID 19 gave people time to think uh, it, it 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 sort of forced the entire world to have a midlife crisis where you would stop contemplating where you are you, you have a little bit more time to kind of think of where you where you should be and what you should be doing and it's interesting that that time away from the rat race, that time away from the everyday go, uh, definitely spurred some ideas and thoughts. So I, I know this was highlighted a little bit more. What, what do you think, given this extra time that we've had to think, some good, some bad, uh, you know, what, what sprung to your mind as the things that uh, would, would spark the next big thing? Frustration. Okay. People frustrated at their lives and saying wow because when you're home if you're doing well you're doing you're looking at what well, i'm doing actually really great but if your life's not doing well having that move to sit and reflect which most people try to avoid because they don't like to reflect and do that internal work so being a oh man my life is not great i'm gonna lose 50 pounds oh man my life's not great my budget's not doing well oh man i'm gonna increase my earning potential and i think that frustration now is starting to drive people to say you know what i have to do something because i don't want to be stuck home again looking at myself in the mirror and saying this is it like i've seen yeah. so many people like i'm like wow they're really having that gut reality check like what people go to midlife price but i've seen it on every level so to me that's the facilitation of change right there that i see i'm not where i would like to right. be and i need to move perfect and i think on top of that you know and what the, i think it's made it come to the forefront is passive income right um you know, the, the income that you don't physically win and Neville would know about passive income very well. You know, his his <laughs> I think that's that's all you make, right? It's passive if, income. If, right? If any, <laughs> if only mate. Yeah. Um, but you know, and and uh you know I think some of my friends down in Barbados, maybe online, 
um, you know, so there are opportunities around the world, you know, and 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 never I might have spoken to you about this in green technology. There are things that generate income for you that um, that you don't physically have to do uh, work on. You know, maybe you might have to clean a solar panel, or you might have to, you know, make right, sure that the right. technology behind, uh, you know, your, your wind farm is 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 solid. But I think, and even with some of the young people, you know, this young guy that came up to me the other day talking about his wallet and with his Bitcoin and and his trading platforms. And so I, you know, sit down with a twenty-year-old and he's showing me all of this information. I'm like, this is some really interesting stuff. But I think it's put it out there to many people that that the passive income side of things, whether that be through technology, um, or through uh, green technology, I think that's that's a big thing. Um, it's it's necessary, you know, because if you physically can't go out and, and kill the steer, you still got to eat, you know. Um, and I, and I think cool. that. Um, yeah, it, it's it's become a forefront, and I don't know if we've really talked about that, but the passive income side of things is 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 the next big thing. You have to try to figure it out as an entrepreneur and or as an individual. Hi, Hi, Pre Pre you were going to say something. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, Enrique. We, we'll, we'll take some questions right after the uh, the, the premier dives, and we'll open up for a little bit of questions. Well, I'll be very brief then on uh, that, Neville, because there's just two things from uh, that I want to follow up on. One thing is uh, the thing which uh, Nori had said with passive income, and I think that that flows to the fact that it's a lot easier to build and generate passive income when we're dealing with a small market like this for persons to cooperate with one another so they can build things that are sustainable so they can venture out versus that continuous scrapping. And I think that's important because we have to focus on building establishments and building companies that can be well established and that can function um, as going concerns. So you can look to expand to other things and solidify what you have uh, certainly and additional investments. Well, one thing I would say also that's come out of this pandemic um, and not to introduce a new topics so we can go to questions, but it's something that I experienced this weekend is certainly that it's also allowed, um, Talani was talking about, you know, frustration. It's also allowed people to focus on their passions and to, you know, and building businesses that are based around your passion is far different than the work in which you had to do just because you needed a job. And so I have to say, for example, um, I had a dinner this uh, weekend. It was uh, this uh, chef uh, Tika Ebnis, and I had, I know Tika, I just had no idea that she cooked, and I was like, and Sarah was like, Tika, I was like, this Tika's like, yes, and I was like, but she works, and it was amazing, and the fact is that it's our passion, and so you're seeing people that are actually able to be aligning what it is they do with their passions, and that is something that can build more, uh, stronger businesses, because, you know, you're fully invested in it. And I think it's a good point. I, I know I, I know uh, Mariku has a, a view about uh, following your passion, but what I'll say, I'll, I'll let everybody talk about following <laughs> yes, your passion wanted, first, and then we'll bring on. Mariku in on the, to, to kind of clarify that. Go ahead, Karen. Oh, can I go now? Uh, I was just saying, basically, 14 months ago, when we were having this discussion, and Mariko and I, we, you know, we had different thoughts, and and uh, you know, I'm all totally about the passion um, and follow your dreams. And and I think this time has made people, you know, sit back and think about things that they may have been putting off, you know, and 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 not confident enough to 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 try it. So I definitely think, you know, COVID has done that. Like I said, I published a third book through it. But I'm glad to see the premier say that because I was saying that 14 months ago, you know, to to the crowd it was like, is this the time to to start a business now? And you know, a lot of you were saying, well, no, you got to wait for that and then that particular thing. And you know, I'm all about the passion, the vision. If you feel it, even if it's not the right time, drive it through until you get to the right time and and meet your goal. I will now turn off my my. No, no, no. That's that's great. Any any other passion speakers before I uh, get a dose of reality from Rico? Because I, I know he has a strong view on this. I think I'm probably a middle ground on it. I think that um, you know, following your passion is is always an ideal. It's a pursuit of it, right? That that you that will allow you some form of uh, fulfillment. Um, but I think that a lot of people get stuck in passion and don't put pragmatics next to it, right? So. Yeah. Being pragmatic about your passion is another thing, you know. And I think that um, when Mariko comes into it, it's probably just all pragmatism. 
and just don't even wear much passion. <laughs> but but I think you know a lot of times you know some people are going to be content to be able to generate a small amount of income for the rest of their life and don't don't um, require big empires like Mariko. So passion becomes very important. <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, Marika, so you did say that 14 months ago. <laughs> Pardon me? Because Marika did say that for 14 months ago. He's, you know, straight like this. And I'm glad to see that we're we're doing this. And, you know, I don't think you have to be pragmatic. I mean, yeah, you've got to pay the bills and stuff like Easy. that. But, you know, create oh, yeah. an online All company. Right, no. on, Marika, yeah. we'll give you a small yeah. time to talk. Then we do want to open yeah. this up to. Yeah. 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 On, on, on the back of that one, um, I, I want to make sure you're not taking what I'm saying out of context. Um, I believe that uh, it is appropriate to be passionate because I think passion is what's going to give you motivation, it's going to incentivize you. Passion opens up that door. But when you, and, and listen, I'll tell you, every single one of you are way more educated than me. I've gone as far as high school, that's it. So, um, yeah, I have my passions, but I've also had my failures. And if you're going to then just be passionate and follow your passion only, uh, to Nori's point, my point back is that you've got to sometimes be careful of chasing what you love because you might just get it. I know plenty of people that are totally passionate, but they're also causing themselves to be poor. They don't understand that just being passionate alone is saying, well, because I love it, because I love it this way, it should be that way. I will tell you right now my greatest secret, my greatest secret. I do not sell the pizza that I most love. I sell the pizza that makes the most sense for pizza delivery, which is what I identified was work. Now, understand that I eat the pizza every day. I have to taste it. I like it. I enjoy it. But it's not the one that I'm most passionate about. So this idea of just being passionate can get your door open. It can feel real good. But then when uh, the guy up there in the middle, Mr. Grant, says, uh, uh, my banking team needs to have a conversation with you, Mr. Thomas, because... Um, okay. Don't I don't know that I can. I don't. I don't know what the currency for passion is when I'm asking you to give me my money back. <laughs> Somebody needs to have a real conversation around <laughs> are you going to take care of your life, your family, and your responsibilities? And I'm not saying that you should not be passionate. I'm not saying. Wait, wait. I'm sorry. Hey, listen. All right. So I knew at some point this illustrious group would become rambunctious, but I'll let Mariko finish it up, and then we'll turn that passion over to the audience. The one piece of value that I can give to everybody is this through the crazy number of mistakes that I've made so that I can be try to be passionate and not let you make the same ones. It is not okay just to follow your passion. It is not okay just to have emotional conversations around business. It is not okay. If you start there and you finish there, your business, you cannot take care of your family. You cannot take care of the people in your responsibility. You cannot take care of your employees and their families. You cannot. Because okay. you will not be pro properly prepared for when something like it. a pandemic comes along and blindsides the bejesus out of you, and all you're then doing is having a passionate conversation, not a pragmatic one. You have to build those other skills that go beyond passion that allow you to then cause yes. your business to be sustainable. And that is the day that we need to talk about our young people, not just you can have you can follow your dreams. That's easy. We've had that conversation. We need to talk to our young people about not just following your dreams, but how you can be sustainable. I will okay. never forget this one day. I'm sorry for, for now my little restaurant, no, right? No, 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 no. Go ahead. And then I'll, 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 forget, I'll cut you off at some point. Yeah, I will <laughs> not forget watching my parents being these and seeing them in business and seeing some of those businesses fail. They would start a little business, it would last for a little while, it would go away. And they were passionately finding the next one. But why did that business have to fail? Why did it have right. to stop? Maybe it didn't have to stop. And, you can't, and I'm not saying that they were pure passion, but I'm saying I've learned some things along the way and you've got to be very careful to not just be going off of the adrenaline and emotion and passion. Those things, they bother me because we, they bother me only because I do not hear leaders, us, saying enough to other people that need to be, have this impression on their head that, that just because you thought it, you can be it. That's not enough. Right. Somebody I'll, I'll, else I'll, I'll else end on that thought. And eat your lunch. Yes, and, and, and that's a perfect conclusion to talking about lunch being eaten. So uh, given the industry that you're in, that makes sense. Uh, 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 Miss uh, uh, Neville, uh, in, uh, at sure. the risk 
causing trouble because I know we're going okay, to go is unquestioned that Mrs. Thomas is very passionate about people not following their passion. And now I know how to no, feel like no, no. in a All right, moment. so it's, it's a great point. So right there, so while everybody's smiling, we're, I'm, I'm shocked because that, that must yeah. be it. It is. Let, let, let that passion flow into some of these questions as well. Rika, hopefully you have one. If not, I'm going to open back up the passion discussion. But any questions from the audience uh, or the participants? Yeah, we, have, we have a few. It's, it's okay. a great discussion. I, I, lo I, love, I love the entrepreneurial d d debate. Um, so um, this one is directed to Lani, but I'm sure uh, many of you can answer. So um, Michelle asks, when researching payment gateways, it appears that overseas options are more financially favorable. Um, is or how can local payment gateways provide a more favorable pricing for small entrepreneurs who need the gateway in order to broaden our reach from local to global? We need to be able to build our services, but the pricing of local gateways seems to affect that us to already have a built up client base um, that we're not in the building phase. Well, the Primo would actually be more suited for that because that's the legislative and um, banking industry. Our banks are, are very restrictive in terms of what we can do through the through their banks, right? And they actually set those rates in terms of because they are the ones that connect through those exchanges. So that's a big issue for the country. The premier has been adamant to work on that, to change that, and he's been working with the banking industry to address that. I'm not sure what, um, there's a new company that's out, I think they'll call, that on HSBC is a company that's so available now, but you know what they call payment, global payment providers. Global payments, global payments. And, and I think you're right. The, the, the premier had talked about this a little bit before. I don't want to put him on the spot, but one of the things that we had talked about conceptually was the government as a master merchant because i think that will help to solve some of the problems but more discussion is needed on, on that particular point exactly so the premier has actually pushed that out with his digital bank concept and it's going to become a reality to actually enhance the banking sector to allow more competition in different areas to facilitate those type of changes that's needed so pretty much right now we're at the mercy of the big banks here in terms of how they want to do things but global payments they're a big provider they operate internationally so that will be the only entity on island i know of right now that i would suggest you even go talk to because they should be able to offer cheaper rates currently than what i think first atlantic provides and the other one is um authorized.net who basically have always had the lion's share and market share within the bermuda landscape Premier, any, any thoughts on the payment gateway world? Uh, no, I mean, it's a problem and it's something that we're continuing to work on through the initiative uh, that was certainly announced uh, with the online virtual market supporting small and medium enterprise, the BDC, and that entire discussion. It's about taking away those levels of friction to allow entrepreneurs to be entrepreneurs so they can develop the next big thing. So, I mean, it's something that's being uh, progress, and um, I'm sure that I will get an update from the executive director on where those things are going uh, with the BDC. But yeah, it is it is a concern, and it's something that is a barrier, and we're trying to, at the BDC, make sure that we work through to get those barriers out of the way so we can focus on our business and not focus on those things that hold our business back. Absolutely. Thank you Great for stuff. that. Uh, so another question, uh, Marika's comment is absolutely true. Bermuda and some of its entities are slow to adapt to using technology to our benefit. Many of the medical facilities are using electronic medical rackets. All health entities should be tied into one electronic health racket. Yes, it is expensive, but the country could have access to one racket to use to improve the education and care of the population and streamline the healthcare course. The only comment that I can make to that, I'm not even sure who's addressing me, is the answer to the question is yes, we certainly should. Yes, it is something that is being progressed and worked on. But this is this 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 is an interesting one because uh, there was a proposal that came to us to establish a, a, a national type of health record type thing. And with all types of things, whether it's in business or whether or not it's in government, you have to analyze to figure out whether or not it's the best approach. I mean, we could technically set up an electronic health record tomorrow, but is that the way to go to tie uh, the entire country into one vendor or one type of thing, or is a way to look at it so you can do something that uh, works better and that will be future proof? And so those are the same types of discussions that businesses have to have at all points in time. So the answer to the question is yes, 
sometimes uh, there is the old adage, which I got from, uh, I'm dating myself again, uh, which I got when I used to watch when I was in university, The Sopranos, where Tony Soprano used to say, more is lost by indecision than wrong decision. And you know, sometimes that also applies to entrepreneurship, but this is something that we're treading on carefully because we want to make sure that it's the right fit for Bermuda. But it is certainly something that if Bermuda had in place, the management of the pandemic and the role of the vaccines would have been easier. Um, so it is certainly something that we have to make sure that we advance quickly. Fire away, Jelani. I just wanted to add something to that. Being in the technology sector now for 17 years, one of the things I think people need to recognize, the reason this rapidization and digitalization was able to take place in nine months, because companies are already preparing for it. So they able to execute. And that execution meant that plans have been developed and analyzed over years. So we have to be very careful when we think just because we've seen certain changes now that was just put around the gamut. Because just because you're moving in one direction doesn't mean you're moving in the right direction. And that has to be carefully analyzed, which our leader has been so gracious to do throughout this whole pandemic. So when persons think, oh, we're seeing this happening over in isolation, like people's been doing um, Zoom conference calls with their doctors. So that's telemedicine. It's much more to telemedicine and that is a lot more to what makes that actually work. Like, for example, would the average user be happy knowing that someone actually got access to their medical records, even if they're in the healthcare perspective? And, you know, Bermuda's a small place. And someone says, hey, do you know that John came here for this and he had this condition? How did they get that access to the information? So that's one of the things we have to be very careful of and understand that the advances we see now, this going over decades of people planning and fixing issues that they might encounter to make it actually foreseeable and working in this environment. So I think we have to be very realistic on what's really achievable. Great stuff. Um, Arisa, any more questions? Yeah, I have a couple of more. Um, so on the topic of solving real world problems, um, the, with the banks not allowing, sorry Neville, with, with the banks not allowing the average person learns to start up a new business, where do entrepreneurs look for investors and investments? The Bermuda Economic Development Corporation. <laughs> well done. Pressure Thanks, off. guys. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm being serious. Eureka, love I think, that. I think, I think yeah. that it's helpful to note that the Bermuda Economic Development Corporation over the last three years has vastly expanded their services, vastly expanded the types of things in which they provide to entrepreneurs, made sure that persons who are looking for micro loans and small loans can get them directly without having to go to banks and to do uh, and to get that type of support. So. Um, I would certainly encourage uh, the, I want to congratulate certainly the continued uh, work that has happened uh, under the leadership of the executive director and the leadership of the former chairman and now deputy chairman who stayed on and continuing to assist Mr. Neville Grant of the progress of which has been made at the BDC. Neville, of course, was executive director way back in the day. Um, and so we're expanding the programs and, and I think feedback is also helpful. And I know that one of the things that is essential for businesses to survive, but also essential for the BDC to provide these services is that if the products are not matching the need, you as the entrepreneurial community in Bermuda should feel comfortable making those comments. And I'm sure that the BDC, as they've proven in the past to adjust their service offering, will continue to do so. Absolutely, Premier. Um, and so uh, that was gonna be a bit of my spiel at the end, but uh, thank you for that. Um, another, another question. When looking at a number of other countries, there is often financial support available for underrepresented groups to get into business, such as female entrepreneurs. What can Bermuda do to better financially support female entrepreneurs, especially Black Bermudian women who are underrepresented as business owners to assist in building their businesses, especially those that are outside of the economic empowerment zone? That is a, that's a, that's a loaded question. Um, was that for everybody? Yes, for yeah, everyone. Just, just while everybody's gathering their thoughts, what I will say is that females represent more than 50% of the buying and purchasing decisions, whether that's in Bermuda or overseas. And, and I would say, if you're not considering or understanding the impact of uh, females, both as consumers and business owners, then the, the economy is not going to do well. Uh, so that, that's more an encouragement to consider uh, female entrepreneurship uh, and, and female consumers. I mean, I just yeah. think you have to sort of think outside the box. Um, you know, we're, we're, Bermuda's not as big as, you know, a lot of 
well, you know, the United States and whatever. So I know when I lived in Canada, there were lots of uh, employment programs and I know the BEDC does a lot, but um, finding investors, finding people that believe in you and that want to assist you with, you know, your brand, your product. Um, those are those are my suggestions. I mean, that's basically what I did. Um, uh, um, if if I can just tap you in here, just very briefly. I mean, I I this is an area that is um, is is growing this this desire for um, women entrepreneurs to have uh, programs and support very specifically designed and catered for their particular needs, and and it's an area that we're looking at at BEDC. And um, we did hold a, you know, we do hold an annual Women's Entrepreneurship Day um, celebration. And for the last three years, we've held a conference that brings together, you know, women entrepreneurs and would be entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs to discuss the issues relevant to them. Um, and so we're building out a whole program on how to support uh, women entrepreneurs. I think it's important. The other thing, though, is is that when we have initial like events, like global events, some of the things that we have done is to advocate and to lobby with those event planners to say, you know, when you're going to source businesses and companies to provide services to deliver that event, that you should have some targets set with regard to the number of small businesses, the number of businesses that are owned by women. And, you know, we did this with the Bermuda Championship, um, advocating and lobbying and uh, having them understand why it makes sense. And I'm pleased to say that, you know, the numbers surpass the targets that we had, you know, set for them. So I think it is about raising the issue and advocating um, to make sure that that opportunities are inclusive as much as possible. And I'll, I'll just oh, jump wow. in without... Um without any background knowledge into it, but it's just conceptual, right? A lot of times we uh, we look at the government and we look at different entities for um, what they're providing as a solution for, for an economic issue, right? Um, that being a, a real and an identifiable one, uh, there may be something or an avenue by which you could create community funding, right? Um, and raise and funding in the form of like venture capital through the community and have those funds directly um, attributable to female entrepreneurs or underrepresented entrepreneurs. Um, sometimes it, it could be that you, the person that wrote that question, goes out and starts to try to build that fund um, as opposed to trying to figure out how to collect from it. It's how do you create the avenue uh, that will allow other people to be able to um, benefit from the thing. Because I think what you actually describing is a, is a community need. And where there's a need, there is an entrepreneurial um, opportunity. So the question I would have would be, well, how would you or how would someone um, take that knowing that that is an issue and create a platform that uh, could represent underrepresented communities and get the premier and or the bank or whoever it is to say, look, put your money up, like, you know, match it. You know, if we can raise, you know, $50,000, $100,000 to be able to assist in female um, entrepreneurial pursuits, I don't think that, um, you know, H I, I'm not sure what HSBC, but I'm sure that there would be an entity out there that would be willing to put their money towards that form of social justice. I think these things are a lot more relevant right now because of COVID, because you see the whole world moving um, and changing and creating movements for minority women, uh, for women in general. And like I said, we have, you know, a VP in, in the White House. Um, and so I think this is the shift. COVID has been the shift. And so out of COVID comes these other things and we have to sort of figure out um, how we're gonna create these opportunities for this change. And I think, uh, Erika, um, I think that's definitely the way to go. I mean, we can't always rely on government. And I think that's a really great point, Nori, about realizing that there is a deficit for that. And, and you know, we need to create a platform for things like that um, and not just rely on, you know, our entities here, but think outside the box and start creating these platforms because it is a huge movement and women are going to be doing and are doing huge things. 
you know, in, in, in their own companies and, and huge entities out there, Google, Microsoft, and the rest. So and I think that's is, a really great point. This is an area where, I mean, we talked about passion earlier, and, and Marika, I'm going to request that you do not join in on this. <laughs> Mute, Mute this, is where, this is where passion is needed, you know, like where people are passionate about solving a real world need. Um, and you can go out there and find the financing for it, you know, like if you're passionate about it and you can describe it. And I don't think anyone could look and say that that's not a real need. Um, but you need people that are passionate to go out there and push for it, you know. Um, so passion, it does win in this scenario or can win in this scenario, I should say. I'm not even sure I'm comfortable being painted. I don't even want to go back to the panel. Just, just, yeah, just, just, um, just before we get into the passion discussion again, we know we're, we're, we're at one o'clock. Yeah, and I, I know it, it's left you stranded, Mariko, on that point. So feel free to reach out to Mariko and talk about passion every day, all day. But I wanted to thank the panel, uh, Nori, Karen, Talani, uh, and uh, Mariko, and certainly the Premier. We thank you for joining the panel. We thank you for your views. Uh, Arika, any last thoughts before we wrap up? Um, well, I would want to also reiterate and say thank you to the entire panel for um, your time. There are some more questions. So what we will do is we will circulate them um, to the panel and then create some answers and email that out to the audience. The audience will also get access to this recording if they want to look back and the people that registered the count of 10 will also have access. Um, I also want to say that although we are challenged by the pandemic, we, we, I, I think it's clear from this discussion that there are opportunities and there are ways for businesses to shift, pivot, and evolve. Um, and if people, uh, you know, just get into the entrepreneurial mindset to open up their eyes to those opportunities, um, they can prevail. Um, and so in closing, I just want to remind or at least say to the audience, um, there are some opportunities that present themselves for entrepreneurs that I just want, want to raise before we leave. Um, the Sale GP event is happening in April. And so right now they're accepting proposals um, for all types of services. Um, and the deadline for that is February the 15th. So if you want to hear um, or find out about those opportunities, please contact BDC or BTA or go to the CLGP site. Um, the uh, emergency grants are currently available for businesses impacted by the December um, public health restrictions. And those businesses are bars, nightclubs, members clubs and some restaurants that are impacted. So please, if you need help, please reach out to BEDC to get access to these emergency grants. Um, we always have the COVID-19 um, business continuity and sustainability funding, which is a combination of learn and, learns and grants. And we've done that since April of last year. And so that is for all businesses who have been impacted by COVID-19 and need some financial support. And then currently we are partnering with the Ministry of Public Works with regard to deploying these uh, $13 million of construction projects into the economy. Um, and so please log on to find out that information at our website, bdc.bm, or call us at 292-5570 or info at BDC to find out how your business can become pre-qualified, those that are in the construction trades industries, so that we can get these business these these opportunities out to as many small businesses as possible. So thank you, panel. Thank you, audience. And I would say make a great rest of day. Bye bye. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks all. Thanks, guys. Good to see you.